For years now, tens of people have been chomping at the bit for me to do another ranking list of the MCU. Well, we're 24 movies deep. I think now's a good time. Especially when there's like six more movies on the way, so this list is gonna be useless in a few months. Let's begin. I should point out I'm fighting a bit of a cold right now, so if you notice the rich timber in my voice, it's unnatural. It's, it's unbecoming, honestly, but we're gonna roll with it. Goodbye, sensitive The Incredible Hulk fan. You'll be missed. I know it's gonna hurt some people that I put this so deep in my list, especially when I'm so well respected online and in the, in the YouTube critic community. Uh, to, put a, to put it on a list so low is just disgusting. Drinking some honey tea right now. Kinda helped the throat a little bit. It's not, it's not really doing anything. I'm a big fan of Edward Norton. I want to get that out of the way right away. It's not the actor. I, I, I love him. He, he's great in Fight Club, one of my favorites. He's amazing in American History X, The Score, Birdman. He has a dozen or so movies that I look back and think, man, that guy can act. I also want to say I don't hate any of the movies on this list. Some of them I just don't ever need to see again. The Incredible Hulk's one of those films. It feels the most separated from the MCU, like it doesn't really belong. I know they bring in that general once in a while, Ross or whatever, but well, I mean, what, what are we doing here at the end of the day? It's just, it's just a general. And really, once Marcus took over the role, it just severed all the ties I had with this film. He doesn't look like the, uh, the Hulk, even the design is different. You know, you don't got Liv Tyler in it anymore, crying in every scene she's in. Now, this is just, this just doesn't even need to be in the MCU. I'm sorry. I have yet to see a single person go to bat for Thor The Dark World. You can enjoy it, but I mean, I don't, I've never seen a list where it's in a top 10. I don't even think I've seen a list where it's in a top 20. And that was before there was even 20 MCU movies. So explain that one, Chad. There's gonna be one Chad that watches this that's like, what? Damn. What I do? You still have some of the favorites there. You got Loki, you got Thor, you got Natalie Portman. Dear God, my beautiful Natalie Portman. The problem for me is they don't have Thor nailed down yet, and this sequel just feels so underwhelming, which is kind of funny because they go back to this film constantly now. I talk more about it, but it's so forgettable that I just don't really have anything to say. I may be pulling this out of my ass, but I'm pretty sure they changed the ending of this film based on test audiences, and that never rubs me the right way. Don't ever let those those idiots, the, the morons you find to test these movies, don't ever let them have a say. I've never heard a story once in my life where a test audience has made a good decision for a studio. I feel like, who are these people even? Who are these people? I feel like it's just some head honcho exec that didn't like the ending and he wanted it changed, or his son Crispin didn't like it, and if little Crispin doesn't like how your movie's ending, you better change it, or Crispin's gonna be pissed. I remember watching the movie and thinking, we established what Loki can do, what his powers are capable of. He can, he can change into people, he can mind control people, but we saw him die in Thor's arms. There was no magic there. So to bring him back in the next scene as like a what a twist, but then not explain it? What the hell? That's just bad writing. What a great time to record a 24 movie MCU ranking list. That was a great idea. Captain Marvel, what do you say about a movie that has absolutely nothing going for it? The only reason this is ranked even higher than the other ones is because it's newer, it's more polished, there's a little bit better action, that's, that's about it. I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but Brie Larson has a very dedicated fan base of people that hate her guts. I myself personally thought she was a great actress. She's been in, uh, you know, Scott Pilgrim, she was in the United States of Terra, she was in Room, which just breaks my heart to even think about that film and what a powerful performance she gives. So to see her go from those movies where I think she was nominated or won an Oscar for Room, and rightfully so, to see her go from that to almost not even knowing how to act in Captain Marvel, like it was her first day acting ever, is pretty, it's, it's pretty crazy. And I do not really put this on Larson as much as I do on these indie directors, the uh, the power couple that's really never done anything too big before. Well, they haven't, they've never done anything big. 
I'm gonna play pretend now and act like all the other YouTube channels out there that act like they have any sort of knowledge of the insider stuff going on, but but don't, they're just pulling out of their ass. This to me feels like the most committee driven film out of all the Disney MCU properties. I just feel like there was so much behind the scenes pushing to get everything how the execs wanted. From how Brie Larson looked to how she acted, I, I just think there was someone off camera like, you need to act stoic all the time. You need to be in a hero pose just with the eyes like this. And just like this, don't really give too much personality, but don't pull it back all the way. Just, just be like stoic 24 seven. That way no one can connect with you at all. Tons of forced girl power shit, like the girl picking out her design on her suit to I'm just a girl by no doubt, a, a masterpiece of a song being ruined in a fight scene that felt so out of place. I. I could have swore I was watching an entirely different film. We also can't forget about the really stupid tie-ins, like the fact that her name is Danvers, the Avenger, whatever, or the fact that the cat alien thing scratches Nick Fury's eye out and that's why he's wearing an eye patch. Just horrible, horrible decisions in the script. It's not as bland as Thor 2, and it does fit in better with the MCU, even if those pieces are smushed and crammed together in a really bad way. This is a bit of a weird placement for me. I think Iron Man 2 is probably the worst on this list. I just don't like this movie. The only reason it's elevated above those other ones is because I love Robert Downey Jr. in the role so much that even a, like a terrible script gets elevated because of his presence. On one hand, I think, man, it was gonna be hard to live up to the greatness of the first Iron Man. But then on the other hand, I'm thinking, was it? You got the origin story out of the way. You established a great new character and some great, you know, side supporting characters. You you had the whole runway open and, and you chose to do the whole two bad guy shtick and then ram in the MCU, you know, saga storylines where you're building up the franchises. No, you save that shit for the end credits. Kevin Feige had that figured out. He's like, we, we put that at the end. Kevin Feige, Kevin Feige. I knew it once. Once upon a time, I knew how to say his name. Oh my God, we're at 20. We are at the point on my MCU ranking where I'd say these are films that I could have in the background and have no problem just checking out once in a while. The previous ones are movies I don't ever have to watch again. Now we're at the I can watch them while I'm doing something else phase of the MCU. We'll call this phase two. I liked the heist angle of the first one more than whatever the angle of this one was. I, it just was kind of all over the place. It wasn't the most exciting script. The villain ghost was kind of lame. I don't know, the action wasn't great. Just a lot of it was very humdrum. There is some good comedy though. I mean, you know, Paul Rudd's hilarious as always. The part where he's a little kid going to school is really funny. I leave the movie with a very hearty, yeah, that was all right. That was a, that was a Marvel movie. If you were to tell me that Ant-Man or Ant-Man and the Wasp or a movie featuring a man who shrinks and gets taller is gonna be one of my favorite superhero films, I would have said you're crazy. And I still would say that. However, the fact remains, I do love Paul Rudd as this character and I like this family. I like the four of them together. I like the heist idea. And ultimately all these characters play a bigger role in the future and they get elevated because of those films, which then makes me go back and appreciate these ones even more. That's the power of this extended universe. That's the kind of shit that other studios have been trying to do right, but haven't come even close. Those that have been following me for some time, I've done, I've done past MCU lists. And I'm, I'm sure if you look back, wildly inconsistent where I'm putting things. Maybe not so much the Incredible Hulk and the Captain Marvel, but I know that Captain America was like way in the back. I've moved this up. This is a phase two for me now. This is a background watch. This is this is borderline a sit down watch because my son Connor, he loves this movie now. And I think the reason this has moved up on my list, nigh, I know the reason, is because Chris Evans is so damn likable and he's so damn good in this role. And as I see him more in the Avengers films and like cameos and other movies, I just, I, I appreciate the character more. So then I go back and watch this kind of hokey, intentionally campy, propagandist style of movie. And I think, you know what? There's charm here. 
I gotta watch this movie. It's very much key to, to a lot of these other future films. You know, the relationship between him and Peggy Carter, the, you know, the Red Skull obviously makes a cameo later. The Tesseract comes into play. I apologize if I'm butchering names. It's, it's, I, I, I watch other movies. I don't live, breathe MCU. I'm just a fan of movies and I think that more often than not, these get it right. This also has a very different feel, a different look, a different style from all the other MCU movies, which is a pro, it's also a con. It doesn't quite mesh with the other ones, especially later Captain America movies, but it gives it a little bit of an identity. And I tip the hat for it. Tip the hat. I'm not married to this, I'll tell you that right now. The only reason Thor is above these other ones is because of Loki, is because of that brother dynamic that's brought forth in this first Thor movie. The film itself is very just kind of soft Shakespeare. I, I see what they're trying to do with, you know, the sons fighting for the throne, trying to impress their dad. There's, there's love, there's betrayal, there's loss, a lot of different themes going on. And to try to put that into this Marvel universe was a, it was a lofty goal. I just think it ended up being kind of tame in the end. It needed one more big action set piece to really drive home the story, to drive home the fun and the energy. Instead, we're left with a kind of a disjointed structured film. We have a very solid intro with the, with the ice giant fight on that planet. Uh, we get Thor cast away to Earth. And once he's there, there's shenanigans. It's okay. It's a little melodramatic. It's a little over the top at points. We do get to see some of that playful Chris Hemsworth charms start to come out, uh, but it, they're really just kind of developing the character still. It's very much a learning lesson. We do have my Natalie Portman though. We do have my Portman. Really, I'm all in for Loki though, and it sets the stage for the Avengers movie to come. So this is crucially important and it's a must watch. But if you've seen it, like I said, this is a, this is a phase two passerby film. You, you see it in the background. You're, you're maybe, maybe making some dinner uh, sautéing something and you look over and you're like, ah, I like this part. And then you go back to sautéing. If you would allow me to describe Spider-Man Far From Home in one word, I would say let down. Spider-Man Homecoming had great momentum and I was really excited to see where Far From Home would go. Plus you got Jake Gyllenhaal as the bad guy. I just, I mean, I didn't see how it could possibly miss, but... It did. Uh, you know, thankfully the characters are all back. They're all just as funny and as likable as ever. But that damn Iron Man, Spider-Man bullshit keeps going. And we have these suits that don't have any place on Spider-Man. I wanted to see him using his webs, using his natural abilities that he was given from a spider and not so much from these, you know, these glasses where he can shoot like warheads down on buses. And the whole fake monster battle stuff just had nothing to it. There's just nothing exciting about Spider-Man fighting a bunch of robots aimlessly flying around. That's something you see in a video game. The plus side, of course, is you still have a great soundtrack. It looks gorgeous. It's still, for me, though, kind of a one and done film. Now, I could rewatch this again um, just out of sheer curiosity if it gets better over time. I don't think it will. It does have that really awesome CG sequence where he's falling through these different nightmare visions. Definitely the highlight of the film. This is not a short movie either though. These, these films keep getting longer and I, sometimes I just don't think they're justified. I think after this is where we start to get into rewatch territory. Uh, I would say this is Adam phase three where I can rewatch the movies now and, and get some enjoyment still uh, out of repeat viewings. Uh, maybe, maybe even appreciate them more. I'm always tinkering with the Marvel list. It's always moving, it's always shifting, it's being reshaped, restructured, and on the fly, I changed two around. I originally had Doctor Strange a little higher, but I'm moving it down now. I'm, I'm pushing things around. He's also kind of doing the Tony Stark thing without some of the fun charm. Instead, he's just a very serious doctor who's kind of a douche. He's got the whole Doctor House thing going on without the cane, although he does get the cane because he gets in that, that accident that really messes him up. Almost every casting choice has been superb so far. Besides Brie Larson, who I do think they can fix. Cumberbatch just gets better in these films. And Doctor Strange just set the tone, set the stage very well. I mean, at this point, I think the machine is well oiled. They know what they're doing. The House of Mouse has their conveyor belts. They're dropping action scenes. They're dropping music. 
They're dropping actors. They know what they're doing. Um, but that's also a con because it's getting familiar at this point. Uh, we, we do have the very cool CG work going on. It's got the Inception style buildings floating on top of each other, folding in. It's got almost a kaleidoscope-esque uh, look to it. Uh, I dig it. I really dig it. My favorite thing about Cumberbatch, though, in this role is how he gets to play pretend and then they just animate shit all around him. So he's like, whoosh, whoosh. He's making these weird circle hieroglyphic things. He's throwing them. And what a fun role, you know? Just to play pretend in this way is just so good. It's so good. I put Iron Man 3 right in the middle. I think that's where it needs to live. I, I enjoy Iron Man 3. I know there's people that hate this film. And it's mainly for two reasons. One, we don't get a lot of Iron Man. We get a lot of Tony Stark. And two, the big one is the Mandarin. Comic book fans, not a fan of this whole, you know, M, M. Night Shyamalan twist that they threw, that he was just an actor. It was really lame. I myself thought it was a clever twist. I mean, Ben Kingsley's always fun to watch. But if I was a comic book reader for for, for this uh, property, yeah, I, could, I can totally understand the outrage. Uh, you know, I liked X-Men a lot growing up. So anytime the X-Men movies did a disservice to a character, for instance, I, I don't know, uh, Phoenix, twice. Yeah, it annoys me. It annoys me a little bit. Not enough to hate the movie, and that wasn't the reason I hated those X-Men movies. There was plenty of more reasons to hate them than just a, a character getting mistreated. But I do, I do sympathize. However, I think Iron Man 3 is far stronger than 2. Um, the action is not quite as exciting throughout the film until the end. You get some really cool suit jumping around while shit's blowing up. I just like Tony Stark in his element. He's teaming up with his kid. They have this father-son dynamic going on, a little camaraderie, a little fun. Uh, he's making stuff in the garage. I also dug that they didn't shy away from the events of New York. You know, he's, he's, he's shell-shocked. From, from seeing aliens and almost dying and the world almost ending. They went in a little bit, and a little bit's better than nothing, as I tell my wife. So to clarify, the movies I swapped around were Doctor Strange, I bumped that down to where, where I, I put it back there, and then I had Iron Man 3, and then this one was the one I moved up two slots, Spider-Man Homecoming. I really dig the vibe of this one. It's got that high school hijinks. It's not grand in scale, and for the most part, it's pretty laid back. It's having a fun time. It's doing some cool stuff with font treatments, with music. Yeah, I just, I, I really like this one. I laugh my ass off watching. It's got some of that Ferris Bueller charm to it, although, Ferris Bueller, I'm, I'm sorry, far better movie. But they even do an homage to it where he's running through the neighborhoods and he, you know, he can't shoot his web because there's no trees around. I just can't get over the fact that his suit is so mechanical. It makes his powers so useless in these films. And it also makes me wonder why half of this roster isn't wearing an Iron Man suit, you know, like Black Widow, Hawkeye. I bring this up constantly, but I just, I, it makes no sense. It removes the charm that Spider-Man has. You know, he climbs walls. He can sense stuff before they happen. And you just don't get that here. At least not without all the other baggage that comes along from Daddy Iron Man. All right, we got Black Panther next. And I honestly caught myself a little off guard where I put it on the list. I enjoy Black Panther. I think it's too long by about 20 minutes. There's some really bad rough CG in the in the final act. However, there's no denying this movie has a cool factor to it. You just don't get very often in these. The the scale of this movie is massive. It feels like we have already built up a bunch of movies to get to this point. It's like a Black Panther Avengers right out of the gates. I mean, Wakanda itself is incredibly beautiful. You have all these different African inspired themes. I mean, it doesn't help that I did a huge documentary on this over on Screen Rant, uh, you know, like six months back or so. So I researched the shit out of this film and just was really impressed by how deep they went into, you know, some of these tribes and how they mesh that into the film. Michael B. Jordan as Killmonger is incredible. I cannot imagine there's a single executive over at Disney that's not shaking their head vigorously that they killed his character off because now we need a new Black Panther. I'm guessing it'll be Shuri, which is fine. Shuri's also great. The whole King's Guard is great. I'm willing to forgive bad CG 
if you have a compelling storyline. And Black Panther certainly has that. And then of course you have Chadwick Boseman who is Black Panther and it's just sad to even think about. And every time I watch Endgame, I have that horrible reminder that he's no longer with us. And it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking. You know, it's, it's, it's tough. You, you, you really do feel like you lose a family member now when some of these characters die. Captain America Civil War is one of the rare examples where the first time I watched the movie, I really liked it. But upon repeat viewings, I've actually grown to dislike it a lot more. Now, it's still higher up on the list, but I think I would have even put it higher, maybe in the top 10 at some point. At the end of the day, it's really a lot of squabbling going on. I know some of these fractures that happen with the team do have lasting effects thanks to the, you know, the TV series that have been on Disney+. Plus. They've really kind of made it work over time, but initially the fallout between some of this fighting just didn't seem like it amounted to much of anything because then we go into Infinity War and they all have to team up again. This is like hardcore fan porn. You're seeing all your favorites do battle against each other. There's really nothing bad that happens to anyone. I mean, freaking War Machine gets blasted out of the sky, falls from like a mile up, lands hard, and he's fine? This is Don Cheadle. The guy looks like he weighs 80 pounds soaking wet. You're telling me his brittle bones are gonna survive that fall? Shenanigans, hijinks. Zemo was an interesting villain though. We're obviously introduced to a lot of new characters such as, you know, T'Challa. We more than likely got our two Disney Plus spin-off shows because of this film. You know, Wanda and Vision had their relationship here. You have that road trip style humor between Bucky and Falcon. That airport sequence though, that's just beautiful stuff. That, that moves it up the list for sure. We're in the end game now. We're at the top 10. These are the big ones. These are the ones that really matter. I can watch over and over, get a little bit more out of them each time I watch. And at number 10, we have Captain America Winter Soldier. What a departure from the previous outing. Totally changed the game. You got the Russo brothers at the helm, directing the hell out of this film. It's fast paced, tons of action. You have an awesome villain with Bucky, comes back from the previous engagement, which is why I said, that first Captain America movie is pretty much must watch now since everything hinges on it so much. They made Black Widow more relatable and more likable. She has more to do here. They really did a good job of bringing her relationship and Steve Rogers out a little bit. It has a spy thriller vibe to it with a kick-ass soundtrack. Plus, I mean, how can we ignore that amazing elevator sequence? Anytime there's an elevator fight in a film, I'm pretty much all in. Die Hard 3, Inception, and now Captain America. Whew, it's good stuff. We're really doing it, aren't we? Number nine, Black Widow, Am I Insane? This movie was mediocre. It was barely even good. It's not worth even rewatching, Adam. These are some of the things I expect to hear. Man, that's fair, that's your opinion. You're wrong. Call me old fashioned, but if I can get a family story with a bunch of hot spies and tight outfits with camera placement that's so perfect I couldn't have done a better job myself, then I guess I'm old fashioned. This has a very Russo Brothers style to it, but I think the tone is even more adult than ever before. Sure, there's plenty of comedy, I mean, especially from her smoke show of a sister and her father who's hilarious, but it's also very standalone. You don't need to know about the events of Civil War, even though it's, you know, it's mentioned, but you could just say, okay, She's kind of a Jason Bourne. She's on the run from the, you know, from the agents, from S.H.I.E.L.D. Who cares? She has a family that she's going to see. We learn about the Red Room. Natasha Romanoff, I think, is in the most MCU movies to date, or she's at least in the top three. And yet, I felt the least connection with the character. It was always just, oh, hey, it's Scarlett Johansson, you know, in a tight outfit, killing guys, cool. What are her powers again? Why do we make fun of Hawkeye, but not her, who seems like, she has less ability than he does. At least he can like aim arrows well. So this was needed like, you know, 18 films back, but at least we got it. And at least now I do get that connection with the character. I find out, wow, yeah, she had a, she had a pretty shitty shake of life so far and she made the most of it. And we do find out she's not just a regular human. Not only was she a trained assassin, you know, brainwashed and manipulated, but they were doing stuff to them chemically. They were adding stuff to their bones and their skin. And I, I don't know, they, we get it all through montages, but it's there, it's there. And I'm sure I could go back and watch it a few more times and really dig into that. 
you know, I, I don't read the comic. I could read the comic too, or just, you know, spend five minutes on a wiki, but that, there's no fun in that. A good chunk of critics said Florence Pugh as Yolanda, uh, Black Widow's sister, was even better than she was in, in her own movie. And to that I say, okay, I mean, that, that's fine. Black Widow's an established character in the MCU. We know all of her tricks, we know her cool poses and stuff. So to have this other character, um, you know, do things similarly, but in her own style, I think, uh, you know, it just enhances the movie even more. I do, however, think they did elevate Natasha's character more by giving her more badass moments and just showcasing how much she can handle at once. Um, you get glimpses of it in the other films, but she's really always working with other people. And here we get her on her own on occasion or just jumping into the fray, no questions asked. And it just it just helps enhance her character more. I've already seen Black Widow twice and I'm gonna have no problem watching it again. And that's not something I usually say about Marvel movies. Oh my God, we're getting there, we're getting there. What do I even have to say about Avengers? It's the movie that was years in the making. Everything was building to this. There was tons of hype. Movie theaters were sold out around the world and it was absolutely worth it. Is it a little campy? Absolutely. Is it maybe too colorful? Sure, depending on who you ask. Some people eat that up. I really enjoyed the movie. I like that it has personality. I like that it has all these larger than life characters coming together for the first time. And I don't think it could have been done much better, honestly. What we have here is an Avengers stew that's been percolating, simmering, until we turn that puppy up for the last 45 minutes and it boils all over the screen. Hilarious one-liners that still get referenced in the new films, iconic moments throughout, Loki kicking all sorts of ass and just being awesome. It's Tom Hiddleston, he's always awesome. And I just can't think of a real negative at all. That's Avengers, it's at the number eight, which means I love all these other movies even more, which is wild. It's wild stuff. Avengers Age of Ultron's got a bigger budget. It's louder, it's dumber, it's got way more characters. It's got a villain who's hilarious, but was supposed to be evil. I mean, there's so much going on in this film from the introduction of like seven new characters to all the different building that they're doing in front of our faces that will eventually lead to two or three different paths. There is so much being juggled and I think that it's done pretty damn well. I know there's plenty of haters that will put this very far back on their list. I'm not one of them. It might not be as iconic as the original Avengers, but I think the action is way better. I love how the team's gelling more in this one, even when they're, you know, they're at odds here and there. But for the most part, there's a lot better team ups going on. I think Ultron's cool. He's no Loki, but he's still cool. We get the introduction of Vision. We have Wanda. We got stone references. We get the Hulk buster action scene. I mean, I just, th there's nothing to hate here. On your left, I never thought three words could be so powerful until I heard them uttered towards the end of Avengers Endgame. How quaint does this scene make Avengers 1 feel? That New York fight? That's like a little, that's like a little side story in this. It's actually a little side story in this. They go back there. There's time travel. There's an epic large scale battle with all our favorite characters and Captain Marvel. It's nuts. The whole thing is crazy. Again, though, I'm a stickler for time. I got plenty to do in my life. I'm a very important person is what I tell myself. So if a movie's going to be over three hours, I just need to have some justification for it. Now, yes, this is a very grand old time, but watching Thor play Fortnite, I mean, was that necessary? Was that scene necessary to his character development? Uh, we established that he's kind of a kind of a dropout at this point. He's hanging it up. He's gained some weight. So there's plenty of scenes that showcase that. So there's definitely fat that can be cut here. I mean, there's a pun intended there, of course. The Hulk going from getting his ass handed to him by Thanos in Infinity War to just suddenly being cool and he merged bodies with Banner? Are you shitting me? These are supposed to be like a act one, act two situation and you resolved a very major character in a very pathetic way. And that's unforgivable to me. I'd move this shit writing back further on the list if it weren't for the incredible ending and the heart-wrenching finale. 
for Robert Downey Jr.'s character, Tony Stark. There are too many great moments to count in this picture. There's also some very questionable decisions made, like a couple that I pointed out. Making Thor a punchline was not a good route to go for a final film here. All in all though, I would consider Avengers Endgame an absolute win, and it's something I can absolutely rewatch. This is the big one, Iron Man. I, I think it's sacrilege not to put this in a top five. And I could see someone making the case that it should be number one on every list ever. Because Iron Man, I mean, we, we don't have Iron Man, we don't have the MCU. I also wrote the documentary on Screen Rat for Iron Man. And since I did a deep dive on this, I was just blown away by how much of a financial risk, how much of a gamble they took on this property, on this actor, Robert Downey Jr., who was essentially just a washout at this point his life was in shambles he you know he was having issues with drugs and other things behind the scenes and the fact that they were just like this is the guy this is what we're gonna bank everything on and they took out you know massive loans from the bank they were leveraging some of their characters to other studios if if they lost if they didn't make money on this thing the whole thing is insane. And for all parties involved to come out on the other side so squeaky clean is just remarkable. I just, what a hero story. A hero story inside of a hero story. Iron Man 1 is definitely the grittiest of the Marvel movies. There's, there's a good amount of swearing in it. It's a darker picture. It feels more violent. It feels more realistic. The problem with introducing gods and magic and aliens is you get so far detached from reality that it's hard to really um, get people on board with everything that's happening. You know, everything's in front of a green screen. So what am I, what am I latching on to for realism? How do you keep me invested emotionally and, and all these different ways? Iron Man 1 is able to do this because there's so much practical effects on the screen and it's really all hinging on Robert Downey's performance. They nailed this film. And outside of a kind of lame last second Hail Mary villain that somehow developed this suit in secret and learned how to use it in like three days or something, uh, I think this is about as perfect as a superhero movie can get. That does really hinder the film though, in my opinion. I don't even think that needed to be in the movie. If anyone saw my The Tomorrow War film, you, you would think that I hated Chris Pratt. Some people did. They're like, this guy doesn't like Chris Pratt because he's he's like Christian or something. Like, I, people are so weird. They're so stupid online. They just pull any bullshit out of their hat that, that they think uh, can justify them liking a crappy movie. I like Chris Pratt. I think he's great. I don't really give a shit what he believes in. What, what do I care? It doesn't affect me. I just didn't think he was right for that role. But here as Star-Lord absolutely knocked it out of the park this is the andy from parks and rec that i love but more mature i mean kind of well definitely more ripped that's for sure you got zoe saldana like she's like the queen of the nerds at this point with all the roles that she's done you have vin diesel as groot for reasons i can't possibly explain i mean you could have you could have synthesized his voice on a computer bradley cooper voicing rocket raccoon dave bautista what, what what is happening? You, what a what a ragtag group of actors that have come together to act out as this misfit group of people. I mean, what what a great idea all around. James Gunn, brilliant writer. I just I have no flaws with this film. I think it's hilarious. Uh, it's got solid action. It's a, got a fun storyline. Uh, yeah, I guess if I was gonna say one negative, it's that Ronan is a lame villain. It's charming. It's sharp, it's witty, uh, it's Guardians of the Galaxy. I've seen criticism here about Guardians of the Galaxy 2 that it goes a little too far with some of the humor, that it doesn't quite get the balance right between the drama and when to pull your punches. I do think Gunn goes a little bit too far in on some of the loony stuff. That's really my only hang up. The pros certainly outweigh it, I think the team is so well formed already that it's impossible for me to not love and care for any of these characters. If you can get me to like a CG garbage panda, you are doing a great job as a, as a writer and a director. That's all I have to say. The visuals go for broke, super colorful, super poppy, but done in a way that doesn't feel cheesy or, or lame. And we have to talk about Baby Groot. Uh, I mean, what, what, he's, he's right up there with Gizmo and Grogu or Gragu. I don't like the name. 
I don't like the name of that, that Yoda baby. But whatever, Baby Groot. Very good, very solid. The soundtrack's on fleek, as kids used to say about six years ago. You got Sylvester Stallone randomly in this. Anytime we can get a Sly cameo, I'm all in. I eat this whole film up. It's just, it's just delicious. Talk about an extreme makeover, Thor edition. Thor Ragnarok blew my fucking mind. This movie is awesome. Everything about it's awesome. I will hear no criticism. Soundtrack, action, humor, the look, the design. You got Jeff Goldblum being the most Goldblumy I've ever seen a Jeff B. Chris has come full Hemsworth now. Fully embracing the frat boy-esque humor that we got from those web shorts where he lives with his roommate. Tom Hiddleston, still killing it as Loki, gets to have even more fun with the role. There's a freaking rock dude. There's a disgusting little alien pig thing. Hulk is finally kicking some ass again. We got the lady of the wood tearing it up as Hella. And last but not least, the immigrant song. Are you kidding me? I love Thor Ragnarok and I will hear no nays about it. While Thor Ragnarok is definitely the best standalone film in my book, Infinity War, that's the ensemble that I like to watch. This is what I'm talking about. Even though the green screen work is in full, full effect, and even though there's some floating heads and suits from time to time, I'm fully ensconced in this storyline. These characters are so damn likable. I don't want anyone to die and people are dying. Even though in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, they're probably all gonna be saved or at least most of them, I still don't know. And I didn't think Disney slash Marvel had the cojones to end on such a dark, bitter note. Then have Thanos roll up countryside, you know, eating one of his alien fruits, looking off at the sunset. He's got his armor set aside. He, he, he accomplished his task. He, win he wins, the villain wins. It's the Rocky one ending. Even though I think Apollo Creed was just as much of a hero as Rocky, but, but still, you end where the hero gets knocked down. Thankfully, the Avengers say, I didn't hear no bell, and they come back swinging in the second one. What? What's with all the Rocky puns? So many freaking characters to juggle, and it's done almost effortlessly here by the Russo brothers. We have fan service fights, such as the Guardians fighting the Avengers. We have amazing team ups like Thor with a teenager Groot and Rocket. We have a battle at freaking Wakanda, which is just like one little part of this story. Vision's getting a goddamn stone ripped out of his head. Wanda's throwing bodies. Black Widow's whipping around in the hot, sexy way she does with that bow staff. Freaking Loki dies trying to save his family. I mean, come on, this shit is powerful. The film has a breakneck speed to it, and you're just trying to catch your breath before the next scene unfolds. And the whole thing is so dire, right? like every moment counts. None of the heroes seem to catch a break either. It's like whatever they do, some other situation occurs that ruins the fun, that ruins the moment. And they have to regroup, reassess, and try something else. There's plenty of criticism to give the MCU. I think the most valid is their villains. I didn't mention how, how lame Taskmaster was in Black Widow. That was definitely a negative for me. Thanos is not such a thing. Th this guy, this alien, this, this uh, eternal, damn. I mean, what a powerful character wh who's, I think, kind of ruined an endgame. Here, though, whew, he's got every, every line feels like a one-liner. Every, every line feels like it was made for the trailers. Infinity War, for me, is finally up there with the Lord of the Rings films, which I think are just perfection all around. This is where the MCU is at peak MCU-ness. This is the Infinity War, that's the bar they need to achieve again. That's where they have to strive to get. And these standalone films in the future coming out, they don't look like they're gonna get even close to touching it. I just hope one day they can again, because damn, that was a ride. That was a blast. And although Endgame gets, you know, gets to reap the rewards of uh, the actual avenging, of the the saving the day and, and these heroes getting their um, their payback, I mean, man, the the setup the setup was so important to get that right so that we could get that payoff at the end. And I think all all of it falls on Infinity War at the end of the day. All right, that's my ranking. Holy shit, this went a long time. I don't know how it's going to edit out. Hopefully, I don't sound terrible because I will be uh, honestly depressed if I have to do this again. 
it's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, maybe think about subscribing if you haven't liked the video because it was it was a good amount of work, honestly. This, this isn't easy. It's not easy stuff. And subscribe if you haven't. Adam does movies. I put out weekly content, multiple movies a week. I review. I sometimes pit films head to head. Uh, it's a good time. I, th I think you'll like it here. Thanks again for watching. If you really like what I'm doing, head on over to patreon.com slash adamdoesmovies. There's even a $1 tier you can sign up at just, just to show your support, you know? YouTube's, YouTube's tough on guys like me. Uh, I also have a second channel that's just more for, you know, shits and giggles. I do non-movie stuff there called Adam Olinger, where I rant about inconsequential things like not getting a straw at Taco Bell, for instance. It's a good time. I think you'll have fun there. All right, thanks again for watching, and hopefully I'll see you soon.